Hey. So bitter and so broken, my soul soaking in misery With no hope for the future though, cause I'm so focused on history Till one day someone cared enough to share just what you did for me I could quickly see how differently you act from the Christians I'm witnessing You live this thing called love while all of us are just so nitpicky You are righteousness, you gave your life for us, literally The thought that you're the one I hated sickens me It's a trip to me how quickly we fall into iniquity Even though I acted wickedly you still chose to sit with me I'm the worst one on the court, Lord But yet you still keep picking me It now becomes so vividly Clear that every test and every trial Was predestined And the outcome was your victory What this video is going to be this, It's main point is that It's okay to not be okay It is so hard Shake it off Man up. Don't you let them see you cry. Never let them see you sweat. These are the things that society, our cultures, and our families have been telling us for ages. And when I go into a classroom with your students, I have 30 minutes to an hour to undo everything that's been embedded in their minds and how they deal and cope with their mental health. I come in and I tell them that you know what? It's okay not to be okay. And it's even better if you go get help. What's up everybody? Brother Christopher with the Heads Not the Tails. Before I begin, I want to start off with, uh, it's my dog China right here. It's my burger. Before I begin, I want to start off by telling you guys about all the different confirmation that I received about this church that I used to go to. So just a little reminder, I just re-uploaded this the other day. So if you haven't seen it, check it out called uh, Their Ungodly Formula. What's up brothers and sisters, this is Brother Christopher with the heads, not the tails. Thank you for tuning in once again. And today I would like to talk about a grand deception that's going on right now in all of our cities. And uh, if you look at it from the outside, you're going to say, Brother Chris, you're wrong for doing that. But the Lord put it on my heart to do this. And maybe it'll wake a lot of folks up. And I have nothing against churches that are really doing something. But, you know, it's a great deception. And I want you guys to see for yourself. So let me not say too much. I'm not saying any of the people in this video are bad. I'm not saying this church is bad at all. What I am saying is... The way they're doing it, you know, it's a formula. Okay, so check out this formula and also listen to David Wilkerson as he will go over the video with us. Thank you and God bless. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey guys, I'm standing backstage getting ready for Easter at Central. I want to tell you, just before we get started, at some point during our experience, a little pop-up box is going to appear on the screen. If you could do us a huge favor and either fill out that form that time or minimize it and fill it out later, it would really help us. And when you do, we have a free single we want to send you called Start of the Party by Central Live. But get ready to experience Easter at Central. The world has a lot of causes. Passionate people with sharp minds work hard every day to make this world a better place. I'm going to stop it right there because I'm going to re-include this part into this video I'm making now. So hang in there, folks. God bless. I'll be right back with you. Good evening, saints, and welcome back to the Heads, Not the Tails. I'm Brother Christopher Christopher. Man, do I have an amazing story that I want to share with you. And 
it's regarding this video right here my latest upload it's not the people it's their ungodly formula and by the way I went to church I went to a new church as a visitor today and it was awesome I really felt the spirit of God moving in it and I wouldn't mind going back to study with them now back to this video here this video my latest upload was just a copy of a video that I already did I just changed the name and I reposted it because I felt it needed to be heard but before I reposted that video check this out now it says November 12th I posted that video November 12th is today Check this out. Yesterday, I'm sitting down to eat dinner with a friend. Okay? I'm not going to say no names. I don't want to put anybody on blast. I was sitting down eating dinner with a friend of mine. And she was discussing with me uh, a mutual friend of ours who was going to get baptized today and that's where i went to church today to watch your friend get baptized so yesterday back to yesterday i'm sitting down at dinner with my friend and we're discussing her friend's baptism and i asked my friend how come you're not getting baptized at this church and she went on to say that she wanted to get baptized at her church, which is the church that I'm putting on blast, the, the church with the ungodly formula in Las Vegas. And uh, it's called Central Christian Church. Okay, now check this out. So I'm asking her, how come she won't get baptized at her friend's church so she told me she wants to go to central that's her home church which it used to be my home church a long time ago i signed up as a member there but when i started to discern what the lord was showing me about the church i left this church and went on to a, a much more word-based church should i say so anyway, I'm sitting down eating dinner and I'm talking and uh, I went to bless the meal actually before I even began to eat. I went to bless the meal and while I said the prayer over our food, I said, Lord, please give me confirmation and you know what I'm talking about is what I said. I didn't say what it was that I was talking about. She didn't know what I was talking about. I said, Lord, please give me confirmation. And it was about this video here that I had made because I didn't want to be wrong about it, but I knew I was right about making this video because the Lord led me to make that video. And he wanted me to show you guys what was going on. So anyway, I sat there bless the food and ask the Lord for confirmation and uh, my friend as a witness heard me say Lord you know what I'm talking about please give me confirmation in Jesus name amen check this out I was asking for confirmation about this video here an hour later after I finished eating dinner I went to go check into my YouTube and lo and behold one of my subscribers came on and commented on my video but not this last upload I did this copy here I posted this after this happened so I could tell you guys about it but I want you guys to see where the last video that I copied of that is let me see here what what I'm getting at is 
nobody has commented on that video. Nobody has commented on that video in a while, like since I posted the last one. And at the very moment that I was sitting down eating dinner and prayed to the Lord for confirmation, at that very moment, I had a, a subscriber come on concerning that video and that church saying that is not a word-based church is a rock concert and that's what I was saying from the beginning this is like a big rock show this is not church and they're deceiving people you know and all these churches using the the Great Commission as a as a commission for their own pockets you know what I mean but look let me keep going. How far down was it that she commented? Let me see here. It was a while back. The very moment I was praying, God had this girl come on and comment on that very video about what happened. God is good and God is amazing. And God bless you guys. Radical grace simply means it's okay to not be okay. People are welcomed regardless of who they are or what they've done. Okay, so right here, I was at work listening to 1060 AM KKVV in Las Vegas. It's a, a Chris, Christian AM station. And uh, I'm pretty sure they got it in the... California, Arizona, and Nevada. Uh, you might be able to get it in other places, but anyway, I was listening to this podcast, and uh, this preacher started talking about Central Christian Church and its slogan, It's Okay to Not Be Okay. Now, this preacher is also in Henderson, Nevada, which is in Las Vegas. So when I heard it, I immediately grabbed my phone and tried to record it, but it came out too fuzzy. So I'm just letting you know what he was talking. Right there you have it. Another Las Vegas preacher talking about Central Christian Church and their slogan it's okay to not be okay. And I've been saying it from the beginning that that is a false teaching. And, uh, you know, you guys, I, I kind of started recording a little bit late, but it was, uh, the preacher was talking about how it's okay to be not okay is a slogan that is meant to deceive people because these churches are, these mega churches are ministers of Satan, transforming themselves into ministers of light. And many people are being deceived. You know, it's okay to not be okay. It's pretty much like saying, it's okay to just remain in your sin, stay in your sin. Just come on in and, and tithe to us and join our programs that cost money and stuff, you know, and it's real deceptive. And like I was telling y'all, I used to be a member there when it first opened. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. I was like, you know, this, this church has kids up here rapping and doing things, you know, but it's all a great deception, folks. You know, that Central Christian Church is, uh, is uh, compromising the gospel of Jesus Christ. And just like David Wilkerson said, he said uh, that they are, they are the gospel of accommodation is what David Wilkerson called this type of ministry. The gospel of accommodation. In other words, they're accommodating everyone to come on in. They're doing whatever they can to draw people in. But I'm telling you, when the day of the Lord comes, 
whoever is sitting in that church, I promise the the ground is going to open up beneath them, and it's going to swallow everybody in that church. Trust me on that. You know, the, the Lord put it on my heart really tough to get that message across that Central Christian Church is a synagogue of Satan. So please don't be offended by it. I know many of you go to Central and many of you believe in what they're doing, but I'm here to tell you that it's a false, it's, it's a deception, it's a false deception, you know, and many people are going to fall for it. So I'm Brother Christopher Christopher with the heads, not the tails. Uh, subscribe to my channel, check out some of my other videos, and God bless each and every one of you out there. Remember, you're the heads, not the tails, and if God can use me, he can use you too, in Jesus' precious name, amen. But whether they want to hear it or not, the Lord always sends forth watchmen to warn. He always does. He never does anything till he warns. The gospel of accommodation. Now, to accommodate means to adapt. It means to make suitable or acceptable. It also means to adjust, to make something very convenient. It means to yield to the desires of others to placate them. Now, you put that together, and I'm talking about a gospel that's been invented in hell and is now being propagated all over the United States. It's a suitable, acceptable, convenient a gospel that has yielded to the desires and the weakness of sinful men. I call it the gospel of accommodation because it's adapting and adjusting the gospel uh, to appease and attract sinners. This gospel accommodation is primarily an American cultural invention to ease our lifestyle. It appeals primarily to white America, rich and prosperous. It was invented out of hell itself. This new gospel is sweeping the America and the nation is influencing ministers of every denomination. It's giving birth to mega churches. Some of the largest churches in the United States are involved in this gospel. It's a non-confronting, convenient gospel adapted. It is spoon fed to the congregation by uh, skits Humorous skits and drama, short, non-abrasive, 20-minute messages, and it's all called seeker-friendly. The seeker-friendly churches. And one of these days, there may be somebody move into the city and try to bring one of these churches right into New York City. They are springing up now overnight, and suddenly thousands attend. This new gospel is being propagated by bright young, intelligent, ta talented ministers. They, they came upon a formula by which you can go in any city, in any town, and almost overnight build a mega church. And as I understand this formula, you begin by going into the community with your workers and you pull the community to find out what the sinner found offensive about attending church. Well, why don't you attend church? And what was offensive about it? And what would it... What would we have to do to bring you back into the church? What would make you comfortable? What would you like to see? You don't like choirs? We'll do away with choirs. You, you, you don't like suits in church? You come the way you choose? Uh, just tell us what you want. And they survey the community and then sit in their, uh, with their computers and in their conference rooms and they design a program that will make it comfortable for the sinner and make it friendly for, they rather than call it sinner friendly, they would call it seeker friendly and try to attract them to come into the house of God. It's becoming the most prosperous, most flourishing of all religious movements in the history of America. The churches are run like corporations, the pastor's the CEO, chief executive officer. And it's big business. And this formula has now been cleverly packaged and it is now being pushed in seminars all over the United States. It sounds good. What they say sounds very good. It sounds spiritual in its goals. It sounds like Jesus is a central theme. And folks, I'm not going to name any names because I'm not talking about the character of these men. I'm talking about the gospel that they preach. I am here to remind you that Paul the Apostle warned of the coming of another gospel which we have not preached. 
He said there is coming another gospel that's going to preach another Jesus. You'll hear his name. It'll sound sweet, but it's not the Jesus that I preach, Paul said. It's not the true Jesus. Paul goes on, or Paul was amazed. He said that you were so removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel. Folks, listen to me. There is in the land right now, with thousands of people sitting under it, another gospel, another Jesus, being preached by ministers who have lost the touch of God and been transformed into angels of light to come and to deceive, if possible, even the elect of God. Paul goes to warn the church, it's really not another gospel, but it's a perversion of the gospel of Christ, which is really not another, Paul said, but there be some that trouble you and pervert or change the gospel of Christ. He said, they're going to change it. They're going to accommodate the sinner. They're going to accommodate their pleasures. They're going to accommodate all of their needs. And they're going to design a gospel with their own Christ, with their own doctrine. Then this awful warning from Paul. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, but that which we preached unto you, let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. Folks, I didn't say that. The Apostle Paul said it. If anybody preached another gospel, what you've heard, if anyone preached anything but the crucified Christ, if anyone preached anything that appeases man in his sin, that's not the gospel you heard from me, Paul said, and anyone preaches another, let him be accursed. And he said it's going to be dangerous because it's going to come from seemingly pious, sincere ministers. That's what made the doctrine called antinomianism so dangerous because it was in the hands of some very uh, fine, uh, good living men like Dr. Crisp, who was one of the founders of that anti-law movement back during the Puritan age. Anti-law, they, they cast aside the burden of the law and the reason it was so accepted because the men who preached it seemed to be so pious. And I tremble when I hear Paul warn us that Satan's going to come right into the church disguised as an angel of light. He's going to infiltrate into the church with his own ministers. They'll come angel-like, he said, preaching a false gospel of righteousness. For such are false prophets, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose ends will be according to their works. Paul said they're going to come and they're going to glory in the flesh. They're going to glory in their might, their money. They're going to glory in their bigness, their numbers. And they're going to glory in the fact that they are so contemporary. They're going to glory in their acceptance by the world. Jesus warned. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. They're to come like gentle sheep, sincere, intelligent, bright, but said inward they're ravening wolves. And folks, Jesus gave that in the context of his message. He said, because straight is the gate, narrow is the way, which leadeth to life and few there be that find it. And the very next verse he says, beware of false prophets. You're going to come in sheep's clothing, but they're ravening wolves. It's Christ himself warning us. False prophets, false pastors, false evangelists, posing as, sub as submissive sheep. I'm going to come saying the way is not that narrow. The way is not that straight. And they're going to accommodate. They're going to change the gospel to suit the needs of the people. Jesus puts his finger on the motives behind them. Ambition. The word ravening here, ravening wolves in the Greek means star for recognition and recognition and gratification. Men are going to rise starve to make it. You see it in the business world. You see it on your job. People trying to climb the ladder and get recognition quickly. And folks, it's now in the ministry, full blown. Young men so ambitious to be one of the big boys, to have the biggest church, the biggest numbers, the biggest crowds. He said, they're ravening wolves. And Jesus left no doubt about what he meant. And this is simply what he meant. They're going to be struggling pastors in the land. And they're going to look out and see 
all of the striving and competition for numbers and recognition. And there's going to be a growing, growing pressure to expand and be successful. They see the measuring of success now by how big the buildings are and how many people attend the church on Sunday morning. And this struggling pastor who's been faithful up to now sees struggling young, uh, uh, he sees bright young men come down the street nearby and suddenly overnight he's pastoring thousands of people in a seeker-friendly church. A young man less experienced, a young man who's not paid his dues as far as this man is concerned. He's still preaching an old-fashioned old fashioned faithful gospel of the cross and its claims. And he's struggling because not many people want to hear the cross. Jesus said, few there are going to be that find it. Wide is the road leading to destruction. Narrow is the way, Jesus said. Straight and narrow. And Jesus is warning. He's saying to the pastor's brother, man of God, watch out. The moment you look out on the competition, the moment that seat gets in your heart, the devil's going to put one of these wolves in sheep's clothing right at your path. He's going to seduce you into an ungodly ambition to compete and to be one of these big boys, and he's going to tempt you for church growth at any cost. And it'll cost the soul of the pastor. I read Paul's warning in 2 Corinthians 11th chapter about ministers being transformed into angels of light who believe they're preaching righteousness but they've been changed somehow into a tool of Satan and I say God can that be possible Lord is that is that really reasonable that a man who starts right can change and become a tool of the devil in the pulpit am I to conclude that a man of God can start right be a true shepherd for a season preach a true gospel but something of hell lays hold of his heart and his spirit, something demonic, and he changes and he becomes a minister of Satan. Folks, it's happening every day. It's happening right here in New York City. When men become dissatisfied with preaching a simple gospel, and they get bored and not, not praying, and they're not seeking God, and they get their eyes on people and numbers, and, and, and they want to be judged like everybody else. I want to be a success. And so it comes out, and I hear it everywhere I go. I hear a pastor say, I saw it on television, at, uh, watching uh, uh, in the apartment we were renting on a vacation. And it was Sunday morning, and you listen to these pastors. We have 2,500. This year, my goal next year is 4,500. And any cost, any way to reach that goal. It's not wrong to pray for growth, but if it's only to feed human ambition, it'll change the man into a devil. Listen, if you find the right formula, it said you can be a success in any field of endeavor possible. This is exactly what I'm talking about. Some young men have come up with a formula how to build a church. A formula. This formula based accommodating gospel is contrary to everything in the scripture. I read in Acts 13 of a gathering of godly men in Antioch. They were out going to send out some young ministers to establish churches and preach the gospel to a darkened world. How does God go about building churches? How does the Holy Ghost work? Scripture said they gathered and they ministered to the Lord and fasted. This was their planning session. Worship, fasting, waiting on the Lord for direction till the Holy Ghost comes and tells them exactly what to do. Number two, they prayed. No strategizing, no networking. No one made a step until the Holy Ghost said, this is the way, walk in it. And then when the Holy Ghost spoke, they laid hands on it and sent them out, the Bible says, under the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You see, Paul had lived his whole religious life under religious formulas. He saw he lived with these mandates. Causes. Passionate people with sharp minds work hard every day to make this world a better place. And all they need is money. And all they need is money. And all they need is money. Today, a charitable gift can feed the hungry. 
dig wells, build houses, or even raise awareness. When people give to these causes, dollars are converted into good and helpful things, and God is pleased. When people give to these causes, dollars are converted into good and helpful things, and God is pleased. But with so many options and so many needs, how do we decide where to invest those dollars? Thankfully, the Bible offers some clarity. In Matthew chapter 28, God provides a short list of the causes that are closest to his heart. It says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. This is called the Great Commission. Spoken by Jesus himself, it outlines two clear objectives for changing the world. Make disciples by baptizing and teaching. Every good thing we choose to do is second to the great thing God has commissioned us to do. And honestly, it makes sense. According to statistics, the average person lives 80 years on earth. Then, according to the Bible, they go on living in one of two places for eternity. When we do good things, the primary impact is on the short side of the line. It makes the world a better place, but may or may not affect where people spend nearly 100% of their existence. But when we focus on the great thing, it pays dividends on both sides of the line. When people hear and accept Christ, they not only secure an eternity with God, they also receive the challenge and the power to make this world a better place. So, when we're deciding where to invest our charitable dollars for maximum impact, the first place to look is at organizations that baptize our charitable dollars for maximum impact. The first place to look is at organizations that baptize at organizations that organizations and teach, namely the church. Okay, but aren't there enough churches with enough money to get the message out there? Yes and no. There are a lot of churches in the world. In the U.S., we have more than 300,000. Each one has been challenged by God to fulfill the cause nearest to his heart, the Great Commission. So how is the church doing with this mission to make disciples? Well, let's take a look at the data. Studies reveal that in any given year, the average number of baptisms at 9 out of 10 churches is zero. And the remaining 1 out of 10 only baptized one or two people. Well, could it be that everyone is convinced? I mean, most people are Christians already, right? Wrong. According to a study by the American Church Research Project, church attendance is in decline. They found only 17% of the population is in church on any given Sunday. The 2008 American Religious Identification Survey asked people what their religious background was. One in five replied, none, making it the second largest religious group in the U.S. If the trend continues, by 2025, none will be the biggest group. Churches are doing a lot of good in the world. They help communities, encourage people, send out missionaries. But when it comes to the Great Commission, the numbers speak for themselves. But there are exceptions. A handful of churches have found ways to accomplish the Great Commission. In but there are exceptions. A handful of churches have found ways to accomplish the Great Commission in a world ever more lost and disconnected. One such church is in a place you at least expect, Las Vegas. Fifty years ago, a few dozen people started Central Christian Church. Fifty years ago, a few dozen people started Central Christian Church. But there are exceptions. A handful of churches have found ways to accomplish the Great Commission in 50 years ago. A few dozen people started Central Christian Church. It steadily grew to a congregation of 4,000. Then, in 2005, they got even more radical about the Great Commission. The result? Thousands and thousands and thousands of people responding to God. As of 2009, Central had more than 15,000 people attending on any given weekend and was ranked as the 11th largest church in North America. What's more amazing is the number of baptisms and was ranked as the 11th largest church in North America. What's more amazing is the number of baptisms 
where the average church celebrates one or two decisions for Christ, in 2009, Central saw more than 5,000. And Central did all this with a budget half that of most churches its size. How? By focusing on two simple things, radical grace and radical alignment. Radical grace simply means it's okay to not be okay. People are welcomed regardless of who they are or what they've done. In the book of Romans, Paul states that where sin increased, grace increased all the more, and central is a living example. Radical alignment means central is incredibly focused on the Great Commission. They're intentional about connecting people to God and to each other, and they're creative in how they do it, especially when it comes to church expansion. Traditional church planting is good, but it takes... Especially when it comes to church expansion. Traditional church planting is good, but it takes the right leader, the right strategy, and the right systems and leadership environment. Without them, 70% of church plants fail within the first year. So when Central decided to grow beyond their doors, they did two things. First, they partnered with passionate people who are already planting churches. Central provides its proven strategy and well-developed systems so that church plants can invest their time and money in the people they're trying to reach rather than reinventing the wheel. So when Central decided to grow beyond their doors, they did two things. First, they partnered with passionate people who are already planting churches. Central provides its proven strategy and well-developed systems so that church plants can invest their time and money in the people they are trying to reach, rather than reinventing the wheel. Second, Central launched regional campuses. With a regional campus, you find a space like a high school theater and reproduce your church service there. It has live music, children's programs, small groups, all aspects of a home church with one exception. The main pastor teaches on a high-definition video screen. Central's first regional campus attracted 1,000 people in less than a year. Since then, they've launched two more, and to date, nearly 300 people have made a first-time decision for Christ at these regional campuses. All of this at a fraction of the cost of a new building. Central also launched an internet campus in the fall of 2008. Since then, more than 10,000 people from all 50 states and 43 countries have signed up to be a part of this online church, demonstrating that central strategy isn't just a Las Vegas phenomenon. It works everywhere. That's why Central has been flooded with requests to reproduce their church in places like Salt Lake City, St. Louis, Oceanside, San Francisco, Dallas, New Orleans, Mexico City, and South Africa. It's why Central is pursuing new venues for church services like college campuses, military bases, and prisons. So that more and more people in more and more places can... Why Central is pursuing new venues for church services like college campuses, military bases, and prisons. So that more and more people in more and more places can be saved by God's amazing and radical grace. It may be new, it may sound different, but it's all great. The world is full of good causes, but to make a difference that lasts, you need to invest in what's great. God is up to something amazing at Central. He's making the City of Lights into a light to the world. And he's inviting us to be a part of this light, a light that will shine in this life and beyond. God is up to something amazing at Central. He's making the City of Lights into a light to the world. And he's inviting us to be a part of this light. A light that will shine in this life and beyond.
Works of the flesh, idolatry, idolatry and sorcery, Galatians 5.20. I'm not sure what the A stands for on that there, but we'll have to find out. The next two sins are grouped together because they focus on the refusal to worship the one true God. The fundamental sin in Pauline theology is the failure to praise and thank God for his goodness and to turn to the worship of I and to turn to the worship of idols to the worship of the creature rather than the creator. Romans 1 21 through 25. Coveting is idolatry. Colossians 3 5. For it reveals desires that rule in human hearts, that the thing desired takes precedence over God. Sorcery or magic is regularly condemned in Jewish literature. Exodus 7 11, 22, 8, 14, Isaiah 47, 9, and 12, Revelation 18, 23, uh, with 12, 4, 18, 13. I don't know why I can't recognize what WIS is, but moving on. For instead of trusting in God, people try to manipulate circumstances to bring about the end they desire. Sorcery, then turns one from trust in the living God to dependence on other sources, works of the flesh, social sins, enmities, strife, jealousy, bursts of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Galatians 5.20-21 through 21. Social sins that disrupt the community predominate in the vice list. Eight different words describe the sins that foment discord in the church. Six of the eight terms are plurals. The terms overlap in meaning so that we cannot always distinguish sharply how one term differs from another. The word enmities occurs only here in a Pauline vice list, donating the hatred that lies at the root of discord. We note that a plural form appears here. Richard N. Longnecker says, Greek abstract nouns are often, though not always, used in the plural to signify manifestations or demonstrations of the quality denoted in the singular and thus to mean displays of or actions expressing that quality. What we notice is that our teachers, you guys are on our front lines. You guys often have a better relationship with the students than their parents do. You're the first one to know the drama between the cliques in the classroom, the first one affected and impacted by whatever tragedy rocks your school. So you guys need to be equipped. And I come in and I talk to go back to what I do. I come in and I tell them that, you know what, it's okay to not be okay. And it's even better if you go get help. And I tell them that, you know what, just like you can get sick and catch a cold, your, your brain can get sick. And just like you can break your leg and break your arm, your brain can sustain an injury. And you know what, that's okay. Why do we neglect the one organ that runs the show? You know, they tried to blur the biblical standpoint of everything and turn it into something else. So the Holy Spirit is really your self-conscious, you know. But where does the evil voice come from? Where is the bad voice to say, hey, go do this? Hey, go do that. Where does that come from? That, my friends, is the voice of Satan himself. That is the devil. Always tempting you. Just like, uh, what was it Peter? Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments. I think it was Peter that says, Whenever I sought to do good, evil was ever present. 
Like, no, no matter what he did, whenever he sought to do something righteous, there was always some negative influence or something. Three hundred thousand people were led astray by one of her favorite posts. And he said that blood was on her hands. And I know he said the part for me and I'm talking about I couldn't express how powerful his words were. It's as if he said the part for me and everything shook boom. And she like she was sitting with great force. And the point opened up boom. She was a flash and it was close. And I the screen was so late, it terrified me. People, uh, adultery, uh, uh, fornication, uh, so many different things that I could actually hear. And people in front of me were terrified because uh, a lot of those people were struggling or went through the same situation and they never repented. So, thousands of one thousand sent here, sent here. They were going, they were flying, they were flying so fast. I've never seen something so fast. And it got to a point where. I was next in line, and he called me up, and he started talking to me, and keep in mind that our life held, uh, held us hand in hand, so anything we did in our life, our our life testified against us, so you couldn't lie because your life testified, say yes you did, you did this, you did this at this time, yes you did, and whenever God would speak to me, you would see a big screen, like you would see as if whatever God says, it comes to life. And so, um, he started talking to me and he started telling me everything that I could have did better. And, and at this point, you know, I'm like, okay, God, you know, I could do this better. I did it. You know, I did okay with it, but I could have did better. So he began to say other things and he brought up this specific woman and he asked me, why didn't I forgive her? And he gave me her specific name. I'm not going to say it. He gave me her specific name. And I knew exactly what he was talking about. He asked me, why didn't I forgive her? I said, I did, God. I did forgive her. He said, well, uh, if you forgave her, when you get on the phone and talk to her, why is it that you treat her like the situation happened all over again? And I'm like, God, but I, I did forgive her. He said, well, if you forgave her, why is those seeds still in your chest? And I looked down. I was like, oh, my God. That's what those are for. Those are seeds of what I did in my life. The things I didn't forgive. So, he was talking to me and I was like, oh my God. And he told me, he looked at me and said, because you didn't forgive her, I didn't forgive you some of your sins. And I was like, oh my God. And he started telling me so many other things and he ain't told me not one good thing yet. And at this point, I'm getting terrified because my mind is starting now going to a place where I'm imagining how hot this, this fire is going to be when this portal open. And so, you know, I'm, I'm scared. I, I didn't know how to explain how terrified I was. I, words can describe. When you meet God, faith, words can describe how terrifying it is to look your creator face to face. And where, where there, there's nothing here from him. There's nothing. Your inner thoughts are revealed before him. Your, your, how, your, your perception, how you feel, everything that host, you hosted in this body is presented before him. And so, you know, he. I got to a point where I just, I, like, I didn't want to hear God no more. I was really turning my head because I was afraid that, you know, it's already made his mind up. <laughs> I was so afraid. And so I turned my head and he would just kind of tell me everything that I didn't do right or, or I could should, I should have did better. And at this point, I knew I was going to hell. I knew it. I, I, I was fully persuaded that this was it. So I turned my head and I was like, I don't want to hear no more of it. You know, my mind, I'm just, I'm just, I don't, I don't hear, I'm just really trying to imagine how hot hell is going to be. I'm like, oh my God, Lord, I have no more chance. If I go down there, I can't come back. Like, Lord, please don't send me to hell. Please, like God, please. I'm begging you. And I'm, I, I'm more terrified. Ter I was more terrified than I can express. And so I turned my head and. And at this point, I no longer wanted to hear what he had to say because I knew at this point, you know, I was going to hell. And I would have my head turned, and I know where there was this warm feeling that would come over the, the interface of my soul. And I would turn my head, it would go in slow motion, and the tears would fly from my face. 
and I looked at God and I was looking at his his judgment. What, what, what was going to be my judgment? And he looked at me, he said, face to face, you don't get well done.